You're watching World Insight, still to come on our live program today. As part of the World War II Remembrance, we turn back the pages of Schindler's Ark, the acclaimed novel turned blockbuster, up close and personal with its author, Thomas Kennelly, after the break. Welcome back. You're watching World Insight with me, Tian Wei. September the 3rd marks the victory of the World Anti-Fascist War. So let's bring back a piece of World War II history. A Nazi member turned into an unlikely hero by saying some 1,200 Jews all over Poland and Germany from concentration camps. That's the gist of the historical fiction Schindler's Ark. And it was later adapted into the highly successful film Schindler's List. Earlier, I sat down with the author of the book, Booker Prize winner, novelist Thomas Kennelly, and sh he shared with me what inspired him to write the story. Before that interview, take a look at this. In 1993, the American historical film Schindler's List did the rounds of world movie festivals. With seven Oscars, seven BAFTAs, and three Golden Globes, it first introduced to a wild audience the name of Oscar Schindler, a German businessman, a Nazi party member, war profiteer, yet also a man who saved over 1,100 Jews from concentration camps during the Holocaust. The movie was based on the novel Schindler's Ark, written by Australian author Thomas Keneally, who is neither German nor Jewish. Mr. Keneally got to know Schindler's story from Leopold Page, one of the survivors in Schindler's factory. Page made it his life mission to tell the story of Schindler, and Keneally helped him to fulfill it. When the famous Jewish-American director Steven Spielberg first read the novel, he was unsure if he was ready to make a film about the Holocaust. But finally, he made up his mind to tell the story of how the Jews suffered through the eyes of an unlikely good Samaritan, Oscar Schindler, who proved to be righteous. I could, could Oscar, there are 1,100 people who are alive because of you who could um, if I made more money. What was it like for you as a writer to go through that process? Well, I thought it would be easier than it was. But the point is that um, the build-up of detail about the barbarity of humans uh, lives with you all the time because you're obsessed with it. Uh, you think, like, like, just like a journalist, a journalist thinks, I can get in, get the story, and get out. But it doesn't always uh -huh. happen. It stays with you. And uh, I can remember having a very dark, time in the middle of the book but my dark time was nothing like the dark time the former prisoners had had mm. how long was the dark time a, a month it happens to a lot of writers that they have a crisis in the middle of their book uh, and in the middle of their book they can lose faith in what they're doing and that's terrible because it takes so long to get yeah. to that point. so actually you got two crises going on one is the writer's crisis in the middle of the yes, book, it, and, and the other is the emotional crisis because you have to right. you really melt material. yourself into these stories before you can put them onto the paper. People had died to make this story. Schindler saved a small number, but people had died as part of this story, and I couldn't forget that and couldn't fail to be haunted by How it. How did you struggle against yourself in order to get out of that trap? Well, I lived in Sydney on a beach, a surfing beach. So I would go to the beach a long way from Europe. Uh, I would go to football matches. I would go to, um, to restaurants and drink wine. <laughs> so gradually, after a couple of weeks, you begin to feel better about it. Mm. You get your strength and your, you get your psychological strength and your courage back. So uh, namely, Australia helps you. Australia, the great outdoor and yeah, the great wine. <laughs> absolutely. Writing it in the new world instead of in the old world where it happened was a great help. Movies about wars usually 
could fall into a trap. Good men versus bad men. Good people versus bad people. But in your book, I find it a bit more complicated than that. I should uh, disclaim that I ever uh, spoke to Schindler. If I'd had a chance to uh, talk to him, I know I would have liked him because the stories were about him being a good guy, relaxed. A man who had no money at that stage of his life, uh, but who always over-tipped. A man who had no money but could always find the, uh, the money to buy another cognac. Uh, and uh, I'm sure I would have uh, liked him. He, like I, was a Catholic and were not the sort of Catholics bishops would have approved of. And so uh, I liked the fact that he was a Catholic. On top of that, he was flawed. I didn't have to be, wouldn't have to be reverent to him because he was a bad husband. He used people as cheap labor. Yes, because that's why he wanted to have these people yes, originally. Originally, and he uh, always wanted to be rich. He always intended he'd make a killing out of the war. And uh, uh, at the end of the war, he lost everything, of course. And after the war, he couldn't get back into being wealthy because he didn't have those Jewish engineers who were his prisoners and the Jewish accountants to look after him. So it's a great contradiction, a man who can only succeed when society's turned upside down mm -hmm. and... and can chiefly succeed when he has help from his prisoners, at the same time respects the humanity of his prisoners. And he, at the end of the film and of the book, his prison was full. Now, when I say that, that mention the film, that's one of my small criticisms about the film. I think the film is a fine film. But at the end of the film, he says, if I... Pay, uh, if I'd uh, sold this badge, I could have saved one more. If I'd saved, sold the car, I could have uh, saved ten more. Uh, and um, uh, in fact, his uh, camp was already very full. Mm. While b wanting to be sincerely rich, he had an amiable regard for the humanity of these other people. He knew that they were his brothers in the human race, as simple as that. Mm. At the same time as being a black marketeer, a scoundrel, uh, and uh, a, a great... Um, he could um, confuse officials. He could bombard them with documentation. He could bribe them with diamonds, as he does in the film and does even more in the book yeah. and uh, he uh, was an extraordinarily confident man. So the question really is what is this really about? Is this about bigger cause or this is about the bottom line of human instinct? Yes, it's, a, it's interesting that you can indoctrinate uh, uh, people to hate uh, other people and the indoctrination is often successful with quite intelligent people. Oscar was a boy from the country and yet he He's survived. He's an outlier in a way. A, He's yeah. almost like an outlier in a way. Yes, indeed. He is too much of a rebel to be influenced by the conditioning that says to the children and to adolescents and to others, you must hate this group because they're a danger to your civilization. And they're not, they're not human anyhow. So you don't have to, they're louse. You don't have to worry about killing them off. It's interesting that he evaded that, um, uh, that conditioning. And in any case, he was a, a, a part of the book that he was an agent of German military intelligence as well. So he was spying for them on the SS and that was, um, that was an interesting part of yeah. his... But when the film was made and Spielberg cut it down, it was six and a half hours long and then he cut it down to three and a quarter 
So he did a good job to get it down to three and a quarter, but he had to just concentrate on this idea of rescue or the, and ambiguity. And what I liked about Spielberg, I, who should I to be to say, uh, why should I be the one to say that when he, he's a far more famous uh, director than I am a writer? But the truth is that um, I respected his, his taste for showing in the film just how mixed Oscar's motives were, just how ambiguous he mm. was. Mr. Kennelly, what is it like for you? I mean, as a writer, the book was big. Yes. You won a Booker Prize for it. Then it was getting even bigger because of the movie. But you know, the book itself was about the worst nature of human being. Mm. The book itself is about hundreds of thousands of deaths during the war and the uncertainty of human nature for the future. Mm. How do you read so many messages all at the same time personally? I was raised a Catholic. I don't think I'm a Catholic anymore, but we were told that we had original sin, that we were born imperfect. And that imperfection, that struggle between reason and brutalism, brutal reactions uh, that we're given our reason to try to control, that struggle has just always fascinated me from childhood. In myself, too. Uh, w one of the reasons uh, I wanted to write that book was to ask myself how would I have behaved in that situation? How Am I think? confident that I wouldn't under the orders of my officers and under the conditioning of a young lifetime do what they did and I'm scared that I'm uh, I don't know the answer I'm scared that I might and so um, uh, the uh, I deliberately set out to pluck those strands out because as you say people had died in great numbers and they deserved that their deaths shouldn't be written off simply, that the full complexity of both death and survival and of goodness and malice. And the prisoners told me this. The prisoners said, whenever we met Schindler after the war, we would ask him why he did it. Mm -hmm. And it depended on the day. He'd say one thing, then in a couple of days' time, he'd completely contradict himself, then he'd say something again the following week and so on. Every time they asked him that question, Paul Deck said it was a different answer. It was decades ago when you wrote the book. Yes. I was young. I had a little bit of hair. <laughs> And now, very different. Decades later, you learn life much more than you did then, I guess. Yes. And you go through this huge fame, a lot of spotlight as a result of it. You are now much more matured, shall I say. Yes. Than you used to be. When you reflect upon what you wrote and this man, have things changed in your mind? No. Uh, in fact, it's interesting. The thing that always worried me is that despite all the evidence for the story I told, ultimately someone would come along with another story and say, no, he got it all wrong. This is Schindler's had a third motive for and that hasn't happened. Now, Mrs. Schindler... Were you scared about that possibility? I was scared about that possibility. Mrs. Schindler uh, said at the time that she was never consulted, but she, she was both by myself and by um, Spielberg uh, exhaustively. But the, 
point was that she was his abandoned wife. Mm. She had, was in an interesting position. A man who's left you suddenly becomes a hero to the world and a byword for goodwill to other humans. That's right. And he didn't show you much goodwill. And so she was angry with, I, I think, with the, the fact that her husband became such a, has become a, a famous man uh, and a byword for human sensitivity, human kindness. And, uh, uh, but uh, the, her story is part of the fascination of the story for an outsider because her story of him is very ambiguous and a lot of people said when it came to feeding women by hand, sick women by hand, uh, she was the one who'd do that mm -hmm. in the camp. Uh, uh, Oscar was too busy drinking and talking and you know doing big stuff. It's a very interesting man, isn't it? Yes, he, he is. And I don't think he was a philosopher or a saint, you see. If he'd been a saint, he could only have died with those people. He couldn't have saved them. But, but the question is, has there ever been a saint? Well, uh, that's a good question to ask an old Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> Possibly not. <laughs> They've always been. Uh, we have always been. There are. There have been men and women who know themselves, and try to. Uh, and because they know themselves, they're kind to others, and that is a. That is a great thing. It's a wonder we're not all killers, because we're pretty savage animals. But we're not. We can sit together and talk and. I would hate to think of you starving. I would bring you food. <laughs> because that's your moral bottom line. Yes, but if I was shot for bringing you food, would I still bring you the food? That's Those are the acid all, test. All interesting questions <laughs> to be raised. You love history. Yes, indeed. I've written a lot of history. Some say history is only the version of story that the winners want to tell. Ah, yes, but novelists tell about history so they can tell <laughs> the, the true story from the point of view of ordinary people. So novelists are great subversers. It is true the, the victors tell the story, but some events are so huge and there's so much documentation for yeah. them that you can't escape them. So actually, who is writing fictions? The writers, the novelists, or the, the historians? historians? Well, I think we're both writing, <laughs> uh, but historians do more research. I've written history too, and you can't escape the person you are when you write history. So it's as if you've got, if you wrote a history and I wrote a history, it's like having a big mass of dough called history and some cookie cutters. You have those in China, don't you? We do. And, and you're one cookie cutter, and you cut your cookie out of that mass of dough and I'm a different cookie cutter. You're shaped like a diamond, I'm, I, I'm shaped like a, a spade and so my, my version of that dough will be different from your version. History needs a lot of missionaries who can really talk yes. about at least what they saw ever happened. Yes and may they continue to come. I can't wait for the um, novels of a new generation of Chinese writers. Mr. Kennelly, what a pleasure. Thank, thank you, you once again for much. sharing your precious time. Thank you. And that's all the time we have for today. If you'd like to see more, you can certainly search our program, World Inside, or check out our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter and Facebook. I'm Tian Wei. On behalf of the team, thanks for watching.